We're going to finish up our full series today. We've been talking about um, a series that's, that's called Full, and we've just been talking about the things that we fill ourselves up with, some of the things that God fills us up with. Um, and, and in one message, we talked about what God is full of, mercy and, and grace towards us when we fall and when we fail and when we go through our difficult times. So we're going to finish it today. Um, I could probably talk to you on this series for the next year and a half or so, but I decided not to. Um, we're going to move on from it after this morning, but we're going to finish it with a good one. Uh, and so we're going to take our passage out of Job chapter 14. Are you ready for me? Amen. All right, we're going to start at verse 1. I really only need verses 7, 8, and 9, but we're going to read 1 through 9 just to give you some context behind it. So verse number 1. Man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. So let me give you a little... Uh, backstory. If you don't, if you're not familiar with the Bible or with Job's um, scenario, Job was uh, a very wealthy guy. He had a lot of stuff going for him. He had a good life. He had children. He had livestock. He had everything he needed. And um, Satan, one day, you see an interaction. So, and this is another thing that you should focus on. Maybe people will tell you that where God is, the enemy can't be, and that's just not biblical. Because in the beginning of the book of Job, you see God and Satan having a conversation. So if someone tells you, now it does, the Bible is accurate when it says that if you cling to God and resist the devil, he will flee from you, but that doesn't mean he can't be there. He absolutely can be there. And so uh, what, Job, it, what, Job happened, what happened to Job is that he lost everything he had, his children died, all his stuff was gone, and he was taken to, uh, um, to a very desperate place in his life. He got a, a, a skin disease on his body that caused boils to break out to the point where they were so painful, forgive me, but he would take shards of glass and scrape it across his skin because the scraping of the boils was relief from the pain he felt from the disease itself. So I know that sounds terrible. But to Job, it was relief. And so his life had gotten real bad. And then his buddies come over and they spend the whole book of Job mostly just kind of going back and forth. And they're not giving him any good advice, um, really, for the most part. So here we find Job in the middle of a conversation. And that's where we picked up 14. Man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble, which means you got a short life and sometimes it's hard. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limit so that he cannot look away, so that he cannot pass. Look away from him that he might rest. Till like a hired man, he finishes the day. Verse 7, for there is hope. That's where you want to underline that in your Bible, hope. There is hope for a tree if it is cut down that it will sprout again and that its tender shoots will not cease, though its root may grow old in the earth and its stump may die in the ground. Yet at the scent of water, go ahead and underline scent of water, it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. So we're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to use a simple subject called revive. And our final message in the full series is hopeful. We are a hopeful people. If you're not a hopeful person, hopefully by the end of our time today together, you will be a hopeful person. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence, first of all but to get into your word and discuss it as a family. So, God, we ask you to bless this time together, that you would use me as only you can to, to give me power and to allow me to share your word exactly the way it needs to be shared this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Revive, revive, revive. Revive means to wake up. It means to get out of bed. See, like for me, I'm a morning person. How many morning people are in the room? All right, all right. We got a couple that really love Jesus in here. I'm a morning person. Um, the rest of y'all, it's okay. We can pray you out of that, but, you know. And, <laughs> and so, like, like, I called Pastor Josh yesterday, and I said, I said, I don't remember what we were talking about, but I said something. He goes, well, I slept till noon, and I thought, you just wasted half your day. Like, I don't like to sleep till, like, past 730. Like, I, I just need to get up and get stuff going, and and Chastity thinks that's of the devil himself, but it's all right. I just keep it going, and I just do what I got to do. Um, but I'm a morning person because 
I feel like I need to get up, get my day going, get ahead of it, and get just, um, I just, I hustle. That's what I do. And so uh, sleeping, though, is what a lot of people do, not so much physically, but metaphorically. There's a lot of people that we walk around each day that are walking, they're talking, they're doing their job, they're interacting with you, but inside they're asleep. They have no hope, they have no peace, they have no nothing. They just want to go home, clock out, go to their little sanctuary, their safe place, and they want to sit there and they want to rest in their own life and they want to do what they can do because the outside world has maybe so hurt them or beat them up or made them to feel not worthy or taken away any hope that they once had. It's now gone, so we live around people every day that are just sleeping through life. But I believe that God wants to revive us as a people, not just as a church, but as a city, as a state. He wants to revive this world. He wants us to get up, and he wants us to go out and proclaim the goodness of Jesus, and he wants us to tell people exactly what is going on and what he's trying to do in this world. He wants us to wake up and revive his plan, but we sleep through it in so many ways. I, I, I talk to people sometimes that are younger of the more of the like millennial age and, and everybody has to protest something and everybody has to be standing up for something and everybody has to be doing all this thing, you know, running around with signs or saying, getting into debates with people that really don't matter. They don't further anything. All they do is start arguments and that's not a way to do anything. But people sleep through what God is trying to do because they want to focus on these other issues. They want to focus on, focus on social injustices and, and, and they want to focus on the problem instead of fixing the problem. We can look at the problem all day long on the news, but until you become a solution to the problem, all you're doing is giving a problem a bigger platform. We have to be willing to do what God has called us to do as his people, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to inject hope into a dying world, to inject peace into a, a, a messed up, chaotic system that we have going on. But we sleep to the plan of God so that we can focus on these things. We focus on pain. And we run around and we say things like, well, where is God when I need him the most? I thought God was going to be here. And I'm not saying this because it's, it's, it's something I've never done. I'm saying this because this is something I've walked in. And it's easy to, to, to sit back and say, well, you don't know. You don't understand what I'm going through. I, don't, I, I know. You're right. I don't. But I know somebody who does. And I know somebody that when there's pain in this world, God is right there ready to reach out and to heal the pain and to make sure that he can do what only he can do. But we don't focus on letting God heal us and heal our land. We focus on sleeping past God's plan and just watching the issues. Pain. Where is God when I need him? Selfish ambition is something that we focus on. We focus on what we can do. I'm so good at my job, I can make it to the top level in no time, and everybody's going to want me around, and they're going to pay me more, and they're going to give me more, and I'm going to get a company car, and I'm going to get a big office, and I'm going to get all this stuff because of who I am. Not because of who God is, not because of favor, not because of anything other than who I am and me doing what I can do. But I believe that God is crying out and wanting to send a strong revival to the world where we stop looking at what we can do and we start focusing what, on, on what he's trying to do. That he's opening up doors for us. He's blessing us in our, in our jobs. He's blessing us in our businesses. He's blessing us with our family. Not because he wants us to have a big paycheck or a big wallet. He wants us to be blessed because, first of all, we are his. But secondly, the bigger platform we have, the more his word gets out there. Amen. The more we make him famous. Yeah. The more we do things to promote who he is. When somebody comes up to you and they say, and they say, Ashley, how did you get to be so successful in what you do? You say, I just gave it to God and let him do it. Yeah. And then they, they say, but no, for real, though, like from a business standpoint, nope, nope, my business standpoint is easy. I give it to Jesus, and I let him deal with it. And what he does is what he's going to do. And I can never lose if I build my success, my job, my family, my business, my church, my home, my relationships. If I build them on Jesus, I can never lose because I have the biggest power in my corner. And I cannot be defeated. If we would just wake up, we would see it. Being around a person who is sleeping all the time could at times be a little bit scary, a little bit uh, intimidating. One, uh, when we first moved here, Pastor Josh lived with us until he got his apartment, and he worked overnight, and so we thought at one point that he died in there because he didn't come out for like, I mean, it was like almost, it was a long time. It was like two days, and he was just in his room the whole time. And at one point, Chastity went and knocked on the door, and she was like, Josh, 
And he was like, and so she's like, okay, he's somewhat alive. There's, there's, there's something in there that can make noise, so we're just going to let it be. We quarantined his door. We told the kids to stay away from it. There might be a wild animal in there, and it all, it all worked out good. But you wonder things. You wonder, are they okay? Do they need a doctor? So in 2014, we went to Ecuador on a missions trip. And they told us before we went that we were going to sleep like, because he, he, well, here's what you need to know about me if you don't know this. I'm not a camper. I work really hard, and I don't want to go pretend that I'm homeless for a weekend and sleep in a tent. I want to sleep in my bed with my stuff, and I want to look over at my closet and see my clothes and get in my shower. I don't want to camp and sleep outside in the woods and deal with all that. It's just, just not me. So um, we went, and, and they said before we went, they was like, you're going to spend... Um, one night in the jungle, you'll be in the jungle for two days. And we were going to like the head shrinker tribes and, and the people that like don't really see outside people. And we had to get permission from the government to go in there and all this and that. And, and so we was like, okay, I could do, you know, I'm like, okay, I could do a night, you know, for Jesus. <laughs> you know, I could, I could do a night for Jesus. And then we got there and they're like, okay, by the way, we're spending four days in the jungle. I said, hold on, run it back, run it back. Because that's not what I heard at the beginning of this thing. And, and so at one point while we were in the jungle, now, our, our living conditions were not great. Um, it was basically just a big wood box that was elevated because it was right on the river, so it was elevated up. I guess the river might flood or something. And so the beds were literally f- frames with no mattress, and um, it, 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 was, it, it was just, it was, it was terrible. There was tarantulas everywhere running all up and down the walls, and it was just, it was not a good spot. Now, I'm not, I, don't, I don't mind spiders, but when they get this big, I start to consider that maybe I should pay attention to them, you know, and, and so um, at some point, I got tore up on my leg. Something just bit me all, like, from my knees down, and I had, like, this, there was just bites everywhere, and they itched, and I scratched them until they, like, I'm, I'm, this is not medical, like, it's not medically sound, but I scratched them until they were bleeding, and I poured, like, alcohol or something all over them just to make it stop. It wasn't comfortable, but I did what I had to do, and, uh, and then somebody came in and was like, well, we got some Benadryl. You want some Benadryl? And I said, sure. And I don't know how much they gave me, but I was out, gone, done. Pfft, we're done here. And I laid down, and I put my headphones on. And, event- and then I noticed at one point people kept coming in, and they're like, hey, hey. And one of them is a nurse, and she came in. She's like, like doing my, like checking my stuff. She's like, how, how, how's, your, how's your, is your heart beating fast? I don't even remember what she asked. I was so out of it. And she was like, are you okay? Are you going to live? Are you going to die? But being asleep for so long like that just made them uncomfortable. They wanted to know, was I okay? They wanted to know, was there an issue? And, and, and when you constantly sleep around people, it, it makes them worry about some things. And, and I think that's what the church has been doing for so long. We've been laying down sleeping. We've not been up doing what God called us to do. We've not been walking in our favor. We've not been walking in our power. We've not been walking in our authority that God has given us. And we just lay down sleeping waiting for something else. I don't have to worry about going and doing it because there's another church on that side of town and they'll do it. I don't need that church to do it. Jesus didn't call that church to do it. He called me to reach out to all people. He called me to share his word with everybody that I come in contact with. And I'm not trying to take nobody from nowhere, but if I can minister to somebody else, I'm going to do that. And I'm not trying to step over nobody's, uh, you know, uh, step on anybody's toes or, or try to get in anybody else's business. But if I can execute hope in a person's life, then I believe that's what God has called the church to do. And we need to not sleep no more. And we need to focus on the purpose and the passion and the call of God, not just for our individual lives, but for our church, for our community, for our children. The jungle was not the easiest place to sleep, but I did it. And we need a wake-up call. Psalm 85.6 says, Will you not revive us again so that the people might rejoice in you? You know what that says to me? There's not praise because we're sleeping. Nobody wants what they don't see, and they cannot see a glorious church if the church is sleeping. They cannot see hope if the church walks around defeated. They cannot see a brighter tomorrow if yesterday looked so beat up. They cannot see love if all churches do is go and pick these little social issues to jump on and say, well, this is where the church, shut your mouth. 
Stay in the Bible. We don't need to know what your opinion is on any kind of social issue. What does the Bible say? Give me what the Bible says. Talk to me about what Jesus' words are. Let me read it for myself. Let me get into the red words. Let me see what this Bible says. That's what I want to know. But instead, we got preachers and we got church members running around and saying, well, you know, this, 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 and the other thing. And then they go and talk to another pastor or another church member from another place. And they say, well, this guy over here said this, and now we're telling him something different and all of a sudden they think the church that is supposed to be united because the kingdom divided cannot stand it will fall so instead of being united as a church we got 84 different denominations just in one county and we got a million other people saying a million other things we need to focus on Jesus we need to allow God to be God we need to focus on the Holy Spirit living in our life living in our churches guiding us leading us directing us so that we can be the hope givers the hope dealers that we need to be We need to be the people that are out there showing somebody there is a better way. There is a better day. There is a brighter tomorrow. There is something to look forward to. It doesn't stop here with your struggle. There's more. Revival is a sign that there is a new hope. You know the word revival is not even in the Bible? I mean, it might be in a certain translation, but the actual word revival is not in the Bible. Revive is in the Bible. Revival is a verb that... Christians put in the Bible. It's not actually in the Bible. What God doesn't say is have a revival service. What God says is wake up. Get up out of your bed. Show people that there is a hope. You know, you'll read uh, in the Bible, I believe it's in Judges about a king. Um, I I believe it's in Judges. I could be wrong. Um, But it's about a king, and his name is Og. O-G. He's an O-G. And and he... um, That was just for you, and you didn't even laugh. He's an O-G. And... uh, and, and, and the Bible, you know, when it talks about kings and stuff, and it talks about Goliath, and it says how big his spear was, and how big his shield was, and how heavy his helmet was, and how he had to have people just carry his stuff to people because it was so big, and he had to have like a, a wagon and stuff that he carried because he was just a big man, just a bad dude. And, and, and you, they listed all his weapons and all his statistics. But when you read about Og, you don't read that. What you read is that he had a 13-foot bed. Because they was more concerned about the fact that he was sleeping. They wasn't concerned about his weapons. They wasn't concerned about his kingdom. They wanted you to know that he was the king of sleeping. And I think sometimes we get in that kind of kingdom where we say, I'm not going to worry about it today. I'm just going to get into my nice big 13-foot metal frame bed, and I'm going to lay here in my palace. And I don't care if everybody out there destroys themselves, kills each other, and burns down the city because I'm safe inside my circle. I don't want to be safe inside my circle. God did not call the church to be safe inside our circle. Next level church, I'm telling you, is not going to stay safe inside our circle. We're going to go out. We're going to go other places. You don't have to if you don't want to. That's fine. But we are going to do things. We are going to be out in the community. We are going to be helping people. We are going to be trying to wake people up because that's what Jesus called us to do. Who is ready for a new hope? Who is ready for a new, fresh revival to hit, to hit our church? You know how many people go to church every week just because it's an obligation? And they go there, and they sit in, 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 in dead, defeated churches, and they sit there, and they, and they go. And then the whole time their nose, their their nose, their, their, and then and then you know and because you know maybe 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 some I've had people sleep on me before and I like to the point where I got down and I walked over to him and stood next to him and was hollering at me after the church after the so he slept right through it after the service he got up he was like that was good man that was great Pat I said yeah well, what was your favorite part he's like you know that one part I said you were asleep the whole time I even walked over here next to you he goes oh man I had a long night I don't care listen this is what we do. And you know why we do it? Because whoever's sitting up here is not taking the time and the passion and the prep. Now, I'm not dissing anybody. Please don't take it as a knock or, 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 or a, a, you know, a, 
an indictment to anybody else, but this is the struggle that the church faces. We focus so much on making people happy that we don't give people the word of God. We focus so much on trying to make people comfortable. Sometimes you got to be uncomfortable. Sometimes God's going to change some things in you. God did not call us to be a sleeping dead body. He called us to be a on fire, Holy Spirit filled, moving, breathing, living church for the living God to make a difference in our church, in our people, in our lives. What about a revival for our city? Yes. Dustin and, and, and Pastor Josh and Chastity and, and, and Stephanie and myself, we went to this place down on the south side called City Life here in Fort Wayne. And it's a place where it's right across from South Side High School. And, and um, some, some, uh, some people, like kids, go there after school and, and they got these things. And I think they do it just Monday through Wednesday, I think. I don't know. Monday through Thursday. And so um, they, they do different things. They try to reach out to the community. And we went there, and we're all set up to go once the school year starts again. It's only during the school year to go down there and to help out and to make a difference in some kid's life. And when they was giving us the tour, they walked us into this, into this room. It was their prayer chapel. And inside their prayer chapel, there was uh, names all over the whole wall. And, and, and I think it was uh, Josh looked around, and he said, oh, that's nice. You got the names of all the people you know, that come here. It's nice that you can be praying for them and stuff. And they said, no, that's not what that is. These names are the people that died in Fort Wayne and you look at around and they're everywhere and the ages start from anywhere from two years old to 52 years old and there's hundreds of them hundreds of them and that's the city that we sleep through when we drive down the street and we see somebody out there walking and struggling and, and maybe, maybe I'm not telling you to give everybody you see a dollar bill. But what I am saying is that if you can make a difference in one person's life, it's never wrong to do right. It's never bad to give somebody the hope that they are searching for, that they're dying to hear. Somebody needs to know that there's somebody out there, out there that cares about them. If I didn't know that when I first started going to church, I would have never successfully changed my life. But God got a hold of me and people came around me and they said, we are here for you. We care about you. We want to see God's plan developed in your life. And they gave me hope to look forward to something better than what I used to be. They gave me hope to look forward to something better than what I used to have. We are to give hope to people. We talked to somebody at Target the other day. Um, because we just don't know any strange strangers. We just talk to everybody. And so we talked to this guy at Target that was working there and for like 30 minutes to the point where they were calling him on the radio and they were like, we need you over here. And, and, and he, he does a lot of stuff. He has a couple of businesses. He tries to help the, the kids in the community do different things. And so, um, so he, he uh, as we were talking, he was telling us this stuff and he said, um, that he went to school for political science. And after he gets um, going with what he's doing, he's going to look at maybe going into politics. He said, because here's the problem I see. I work with a lot of underprivileged kids. And what I notice is that the people who have the money and who can go and pay these big prices to go and have this, this, um, the, the, their kids trained by these you know, real big organizations, they can do that. But there's a lot of kids that want to play football, that want to do this, that can't afford these big coaches and all these things. And so he will, a lot of times, because of grants and scholarships, just let them come and he will take care of costs and he does all this stuff to try to better the kid's life in these communities. And he said what he noticed is that the only people that really ever matter are the people that have the money that can write the checks. And he said he wants to be the one who changes that. And I sat there and I thought, we need to be the one who changes that too. We are the church. If there's one place that anybody should look, it should be in the powerful church that Jesus died for. We are the ch agents of change in this community. We should be, it shouldn't be people running around and, and, and just stepping over the church. They should be running around and, and getting the churches involved and saying, hey, we want you to come and be a part of what we're doing over here because we see that you want to be about your community. When I was in Orlando, the kids' school had me come um, one, at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, and uh, the principal was a Christian guy, went to another church, and he found out I was a pastor, and he said, well, I want you to come before the testing, and we're going to walk the whole hallways, and we're going to pray over the school, and we're going to pray over all the testing classrooms, and we're, now he could have probably gotten in trouble if, if they had known that. I don't know. I mean, but, but it was on a Saturday. It wasn't during school hours, and so he had us come in there, and he had us pray. Why? 
Because we are called to be the change makers. We are called to bring the hope where there is no hope. To bring the love where there is no love. To bring the peace where there is no peace. We are called to be the people who make a difference in the lives of our community, in the lives of our family, in the lives of our everything that we do. We are the ones that people look to. Even when you don't know they're looking. They're looking. And they're watching. And sometimes they're looking to see if, if the pressure gets turned up, are you going to fall? If, if you get angry enough, are you going to start cussing everybody out and lose everything that you've built up over the last five years? Because it's, it's real hard to build a reputation, but it's real easy to lose it. And we need to have revival. We need to be woken up. We need to have hope put right back into the center where it's supposed to be. The Bible says that the, the big three, the big three, faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love, but you have to have all three working in your life as a believer. You have to have faith, you have to have hope, and you have to have love. Some people are really good at faith, not so good with hope and love. Some people are good with love, but have no faith. And some people are good with both of them, but have no hope. A lot of times, hope gets pushed to the side because hope is not something that we think we can have. We have faith, and it doesn't work for us. We give love, and nobody cares. So why should I have hope when I've done the other two and nothing matters? No, you need all three of them working together in your life, and that's when God is going to do something that you never thought he would do. These are questions that we're faced with today. Okay? Do you know hopeless people? Maybe you got some in your mind right now. Do you know sleeping people? Now, here's the toughest one of all of them. Are you one or both of those? I'm not talking about physically sleeping until 12 o'clock. I don't, I, don't, I don't care because what matters is what you do with your time when you're awake, not what you do with your time when you're sleeping. That's why I try to spend a lot of time awake. Also because at like 10 o'clock, my body shuts down. So like, like my, Josh came in this morning, he's like, you're not even wearing a tie. And you're wearing it. No, I'm telling. And, and he said, and, he's, and, and I said, so what? I'm doing, I didn't go, I got like five hours of sleep. Let me be. But then Kenny, my man right here who loves me and cares about me, he said, you look dope. So I'm, I'm amen. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take Kenny's assessment because he was putting hope in where you were trying to steal. No, I'm just joking. I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. These are the people that we're around every day, hopeless people, sleeping people, just dying each and every day spiritually, emotionally, relationally, because they don't have anybody to look forward to. They don't have anybody to show them that there's a difference. We are the hopeful. We are the change makers. We are the church of a living God, a very real God. That is who we are. And God moves in very real ways in the lives of his people. But if we don't put it out there so people can see it, then why should, what, what, what is it about church that anybody else wants? I see you go to church every Sunday, and I see how your life looks. Why should I go? Oh, I see, I see that, that you serve this God, you serve Jesus, but you just had to go through three funerals in a row. Why should I go? Well, I see that, that you give your money and your time and your talent to the church, but you're broke as all get out. I'm not doing that. I can't tell you why things happen the way they happen, but what I can tell you is that when we get into God's presence and we live a life according to biblical mandates, God will always take care of us, just like Job. Sometimes we're going to find ourselves broke. We're going to find ourselves with nothing, hopefully not with body sores all over us, scraping them with glass, but we're going to go through some tough times. And what we have to do is understand that we don't need to fill ourselves and, and surround ourselves with people who are just going to go, well, if God really loved you or, or this, 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 and give us bad advice. We need to fill ourselves and surround ourselves with people who are going to say, Kenny, I know it's a tough time. I know you're in a low spot. I know you're having a rough season, but God is bigger than your rough season, and I'm right here, and I'm going to pray with you, and I'm going to lift you up, and I'm going to continue to walk with you every step of the way, and then when you get out of this rough season, it's your job to go and share with somebody else. Yeah, you know what? I was struggling, but let me tell you what. I kept my faith right where it needed to be. I kept my hope right where it needed to be, and God moved in my life in such a powerful and real way. I know now more than I knew ever before that he is right there walking with me when I can hear him, when I can see him, or when he's completely quiet. I know he's there because he's God. And 
And when he's standing next to me, nobody can beat me. I can never fall down. I can never be beaten. I can never be beat up because God is too big and too strong and standing right next to me. That was a perfect opportunity for y'all to give God some praise. This is easily seen in 1 Kings 18 with Elijah. The Philistine God was not responding to his, to, they're, they're on Mount Carmel, they're having this battle, and all of a sudden, the, the, Elijah says, we're going we're gonna to build an altar, we're going to put our stuff on the altar, and then whoever's God answers by fire, he is the God. And he said, okay, so the Philistines are out there, and they're screaming out to their God, and they're saying, oh, you got to do this, we're going to lose to this guy. And, 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 and Elijah, you know, to the point where they're cutting themselves yeah. because they're trying to get their God. They're like, no, you got to do it. We're going to kill ourselves if you don't come. And Elijah's sitting back there. I, I, I think Elijah just was kind of leaning back on something, you know, just chilling because he's a real smart mouth like myself. So this is what I would do. I would be laying back like this and I'd be like, yeah, not looking good for you guys. No, no, no. You guys have had better days, I'm sure. Today's a rough one. And Elijah says things to him like, well, maybe your God went on vacation. This is in the Bible. Maybe, maybe, maybe your God is resting, took a nap. Maybe your God is in the bathroom. It's in the Bible. Read it. Maybe your God is somewhere else. And he said, all right, stop this. This is stupid. He said, go grab some water pots. Now, what you have to understand is there was a drought. And he said, go get some water pots and pour it all over the the altar. So he was taking water that they didn't have to do something that they wasn't appreciating. Dump out all your water source on this offering right here. Okay, well, we're going to do it. No, no, no. I want 12 barrels dumped on this right here. And he did it. And then Elijah said 63 words. His prayer consisted of 63 words. I think sometimes we think that we got to say all this stuff before God moves. 63 words. What matters is where it comes from, not what you say. 63 words, and God sent fire from heaven, and he burned up the offering. He licked up every last bit of water that was on the ground. It was so powerful that it it got some of the people around, and then Elijah looked over at him and goes, y'all better run. (laughs) And then, and then they, that's the Jonathan translation. And then he ran, and then, and then they, he said, nah, go get them. And they went and they got all the 450 prophets and they wiped them all out because Elijah was saying, one true God. We serve one true God. We serve a God that answers by fire. We serve a God that does all this stuff. Yeah, pastor, it's easy to say, be hopeful, but I've been hurt. You haven't walked through my shoes. You're right, I haven't, but I have walked through mine. And I know exactly what it's like. I know struggle. I know pain. I know hurt. You want me to give you something nice and cute that you can take home and say you got a cool little acronym? Let me give you hope. H-O. O-P-E. You ready for it? Hold on, pain ends. Don't just sit there in your hope. Hold on, pain ends. Hold on. I wish I could say I made that. I did not make that. That was, <laughs> that's not from me. I mean, you can gladly tell people that, that I did it if you want, but I didn't do that. And so, um, but hold on, pain ends. Don't just sit there and deal with the fact that you're having this struggle. Having done all that you can do to stand, just stand there. Brace yourself. Get ready for what's going to happen next. you got to be ready to turn every way because the fight's going to come, and it's not just going to come this way. It's going to come from this way. So you got to be ready all the time to make sure that whatever you're doing, you're standing there. Your hope is strong. Your faith is strong. You're ready to go. Bring it on. I'm ready for you because what's inside of me is greater than anything you can throw at me. I am better, not because of who I am, but because of whose I am. People lose hope because of hurt, but people lose hurt because of hope. The Bible said in our passage that there is hope for a tree. Hope for a tree. The Bible oftentimes refers to us as trees. Be like trees planted next to rivers of living water. Be trees. Be tree. We are to be flexible like a palm tree. We are to do all these different things. Be like a tree. The word uh, uh, hope that we have in this passage is not just hope like, oh, I hope something comes. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not something like that. It's it's a word that that shows expectancy. In the Hebrew, it's it's tikvah. It literally means a cord. 
a cord like you would tie something with. It, 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 it's saying to tie something together with expectancy. When you say, I hope, you say, I'm tying this together with expectancy that it will happen. And it's the same word used in Jeremiah 29, 11, when God says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. He says, they are thoughts of hope. And what he's saying is that my, the, the thoughts of hope that I have with you, for you, are tied together with this cord to your future. My plans are tied to your future. That is the hope that he talks about. It's the same word used in Joshua 2.21. The, 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 the spies were sent into Jericho, and they were looking around, and all of a sudden they almost got caught, but Rahab, who for some reason has kept the name the harlot since all the way back there to here, she's still the harlot, but that's kind of jacked up, but Rahab the harlot, she, um, she, she finds them and she hides them. And she makes sure that they get out. And she makes this deal with them to say, all right, but you got to spare my family when you come in here. And they said, here, take this scarlet cord and tie it around your, your window frame so that we come back, your family will be saved. And so what she did was she tied her cord, hold on, she tied her hope around the window frame so that when they came back, it was her hope that saved her. It was her hope that freed her. It was her hope that got safety for her family. We have to do things in a level of hope that says that no matter what happens, I'm tying myself together with the promises of God. The cord that I am using right now to do this is stronger than any attack of the enemy. This is what happens in my life. The Bible says she tied a scarlet cord, and the word for cord is the same thing. She tied her hope to that window. Amen. And it was her hope that saved her. It was her hope that saved her family. It was her hope that got her out of there. In other words, she knew what she had to do, and it was more than just asking. It was more than she had to exercise her hope. She had to exercise her faith, and she had to trust God knowing that this would happen. Here's something else you might not know. Job was not a Jew. Job was a Gentile. But Job was very much favored by God. Before Jesus, before a new covenant, Job was favored by God. God said, have you considered my servant Job? Job should have never been considered God's servant. He was a Gentile, but he was. You know what that says to me? Don't worry about what you were. Don't worry about what people label you. Don't worry about when you get yourself connected to God. It doesn't matter what people call you. It doesn't matter what people label you. Hope will beat everything. All right, let me skip a couple things here, shutting me down. Hope will wake you up. In 2008, President Obama built a whole campaign around the word hope. Now, whether you're a President Obama supporter or not, I do not care. What I know is that he knew the importance and the value of hope, and he built an entire campaign around one word, hope, and another word, change. Hope and change, hope and change. You know what it did? It fired people up. Because there is something about hope. There is something about a better future. There is something about a change. There is something that happens inside of you when you hear those things. that make. Now, I'm here to tell you this. While it was successful for a presidential campaign, I don't believe that's where God stops it. Hope is what he puts in each and every one of us. Hope is what he has for us to go out and to deliver to this city. Hope is what he has when we go and we talk to our children. When we deal with, with loss, with pain, he pours hope into our life so that he can, he can do so much more in us if, he would just, if we would allow him to get to us. We keep God off because we don't want him to us, but he can't do nothing with us if he can't get here. Jesus died for hope, but more than that, Jesus got up for hope, and he died, he, he, he died to give what he wants us to live. He died to give what he wants us to live. So what is hope? Let me give you a couple things, and we're out of here. First of all, this is what hope does. Hope will repair what's broken. Verse 7, there is hope for a tree that is cut down, that it will sprout again. The dictionary says that hope is a feeling of want, a feeling of something that, 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 uh, that you just hope will happen, something that you believe a good end will come about what you're going through. But according to this, there's hope for a tree that is broke that is cut down, that it will grow again. Do you know what that means? That means it's possible to be cut down but not cut off. 
It is possible to fall and get back up. It is possible to deal with things. And, and so Job sees all this stuff, and he sees this as you can go back into verse 4, 5, and 6. He sees it as condemnation in his life, that he's being condemned for something. But it's not condemnation when you go through hard times. It's not condemnation. It's because God knew how powerful and how good Job was and how much favor Job had. And let me explain it to you this way. God knows how much favor you have, and God knows how much potential you have. And and God knows how much purpose you have because he put it in there. That when you walk through tough times, it's not condemnation, it's confidence in who you are. God says, have you tried Josh? Have you tried Danita? Have you tried Kenny? Have you tried Tim? Have you tried these people? Because I have no doubt that when you turn up the heat, they're going to live it out. They're going to walk it out. And they're not going to lose their hope because you turn up a little heat in their life. Com condemnation is not what God gives he, it's confidence in who we are. I've walked through some things that I do not want to walk through, but I've had to. Well, how do you know he's so confident? He spent 40-something books complaining. Well, you can tell he's confident if you go to Job chapter 13 because he says something real nice in, in verse 15. Job chapter 13, verse 15, after he's going through all this stuff, he says this. He says, though he slay me, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Yet will I walk with him. Yet will I love him. Even though I go through hard times, I will not lose who he is in my life. I will not lose who he is in my family. I will not lose it. I will not take my eyes off of him because of what's going on around me. I will focus directly on who he is in my life. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The second thing that hope will do is it will replenish what's weak. Hope will replenish what's weak. It will give new strength. It will do a new thing. Verse 8, though the root may grow old in the earth and its stump might die, it is possible for God to bring life out of death. It is possible for God to bring something that you thought it was over. I can never go back to that. I can never be what God said I would be. I can never have the life God said I would have. It's old. It's died in the ground. But the Bible says that there's hope. I can never be successful in this area, but the Bible says there's hope. My children will never come back to God. No, no, no. Jeremiah 31, 16 says they will come back from the land of the enemy. We stand on God's promise because it strengthens where we're weak. It makes us strong when we don't think we can continue. It's, it's, like, it's like Mickey and Rocky giving us the worst motivational speech. Get up, you bum! I don't know if y'all know what Rocky is, but it's a boxing movie, and he had an old crotchety manager, and he'd be in the corner like, get up, Rocky, you bum. It's strengthening where you're weak. It's saying these are the areas that you can't deal with, so I'm going to build them up. I'm going to put strength in you that you never thought you could have. You're going to be able to walk through things that you thought, and they probably would have killed you 10 years ago, but today... Because of what you went through 10 years ago, you can go through even more today. That's what happens. God's word will revive us. How do we strengthen ourselves? Well, according to Psalm 119 and verse 11, it is your word that I have hidden in my heart that I will not sin against God. It is God's word that strengthens us. It is God's word. That's why we come here and we get into this Bible. I know I might not sit here and read you passage after passage, but I feel what I'm talking about with scripture because it is only through God's word that we have hope. It is only through God's word that we have healing, that we have anything because of who God is and if we become familiar with his word we will know his plan for our life psalm 119 25 continues and says revive me according to your word but then it's like the word of god in exodus 3 strengthened moses when he felt inadequate god's very word spoke to him or Jeremiah in chapter 1, when Jeremiah was nervous and afraid to go out and talk to people because of his age, because of different things. And, and you, you'll read through, God gave him strength when he was afraid. Verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That means you had a purpose before you were ever born. And in verse 8, he said, don't be afraid of their faces. Don't worry about what they look like or how they look at you. Focus on him, not them. Focus on him where your hope comes from, not the people around you that are trying to tear it down. There's always going to be somebody who's ready to tear down your hope, who's ready to say, you can never do it. Hey, you can never do it. And 
can't, I know you've got your little crew and your people that you, you can't do it. You can't do it. And that's when you say, no, 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 no. See, that's where you're wrong. I can do it because I, am, I have got connected with this God. And maybe I've been connected with him before but walked away. Maybe I've never been connected with him. But I got connected with this God, and he's a living God. He's not like one of these other guys. He's a, he's a living, resurrected, raised, sitting at the right hand of the Father, God. And when he's up inside of here, there's nothing that can beat me. Oh, yeah, you can do it. Behold, I have put words in your mouth, verse 9. I have put words in your mouth. You start it. He will finish it. There's no way I could come in here and share with you for five minutes, let alone 40 minutes. Maybe 45 and a half. If, all right, we're done there. Um, there's no way I can do it if it wasn't God speaking to me. He puts the words there. I just say them. The last thing it does is it replaces what's lost. You ready? Verse 9 is my favorite part. Verse 9 is my absolute favorite part. Yet at the scent of water, at the scent of water, you don't even have to be in the water. You just have to be close to the water. You ever walked into a restaurant real hungry? And all, I went to the DMV yesterday, or BMV. Sorry, we're in Indiana. We went to the BMV yesterday, and, and I walked out, and there was a dude smoking chicken in the parking lot, and there was a restaurant. Oh, and, and between the bacon and the barbecue chicken and everything, I was like, take me, Lord, take me. Come on, right now. I could go right now and be good right now. It was beautiful. But it did nothing for me just to smell it. I knew it was there because I could smell it. And God is saying, if you get close enough to even smell what I'm doing, if you get close enough to hear what I'm saying, if you get close enough to even be a, close to my presence, at the scent of water, at the scent of water, it will bud. The bud symbolizes the new life. The new life. What's dead in your life will bud. The marriage that you thought was failing apart is budding right now. The children you thought were lost forever, they're budding right now because you've gotten close to the scent of water, the scent of God's presence, the scent of the Holy Spirit, the scent of God's purpose. You've gotten close to the scent of it, so now there's buds popping up everywhere. You don't even know how that extra $20 got in your bank account, but you know you need gas, and there it is because it's budding. It's budding. There's life coming. It's budding. It's waking up. Things are happening, and you don't know how, but you just know you got close. And now you want to get even closer to the water because you can see the buds. But it doesn't just stop with the buds. It will bring forth branches. That means that little sprout of God's blessing is going to turn into an overflow in your life. The little bit that comes out at first is going to turn into so much more you get close to the presence of God. We're going to close for real, for real, with a, with a scripture. And I wish you wouldn't have said that. No, it's not a joke. We're for real going to close. These people, Wendy. She wasn't saying that about closing. She was saying that as worship. Okay. <laughs> That's going to make me swah. Job 42, verse 9. I'm going to read you a passage, and then we're going to shut it down. I'm going to read you a passage and tell you a story. I'm giving you every line, and then we're done, okay? Job 42, verse 9. All you have, what, this is what happens. After you get close to God, and after you do what you're doing, I'm in Psalm, not Job. I was like, what? This doesn't look right. See what you did? See what you did to me? I'm all over here trying to get it figured out for you, and this is what it is. Now I'm in Job. Now I'm ready for you. Verse, uh, verse 10 and verse 12. Job, God got so upset with Job's buddies, he was like, you need to go pray for them. And so verse 10 says, and the Lord restored, restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job, gave Job twice as much as he had before. Verse 12, now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginnings. 
What you lose in the process, God will give you in the promise. You cannot get away from God enough to where he says, I cannot use this no more. When you go back to God and you get closer to him and you get in the presence of God, he will restore to you everything that was lost. Not just restore it to you, but give you more. The bud will turn into a branch and it will be a blessing into your life and your latter days will be better than the beginning and you will think I have no more hope. But God said, oh, hope you ain't even seen the beginning of hope yet what I'm about to do in your next 50 years will be more than what you ever thought could have happened in your first 50 that's what God will do here's where we're gonna stop here's my story and we're done we pray with the kids ever since they could talk we pray with them before bed I'm not gonna say we're perfect we don't do it every night and we mess up but we, we try to be there we try to instill prayer as a central theme of our life before school all that and Jaden, I just corrected it, so even since we've been here, Jaden, um, I learned something in this whole process of, of building this message that I didn't really understand properly. And, and, and so when we would pray, Jaden would start his prayer like this, like Isaiah would say, God, we just ask that you would do this and that, and that you would bless us. And Elijah would do the same thing. Jaden would say, God, I hope that you give us a good night. And I said, Jaden, you don't have to hope. You're, call, you're telling God, you're, 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 you're using your authority. You're, you don't have to hope. You say, God, I pray. But you know what I learned this week? Hope is not a wish. Hope is an assurance. So when they're saying, I hope, they're saying, I already know what's happening. I'm tying my cord to God's promise, and I'm injecting hope into a situation. I learned that this week, and Jaden taught me that without even knowing it. I hope. What he's saying is I'm tying my cord around your promise that everything that I call on, everything that you've shown me, everything that I require will come because of who you are. So now I'm going to ask you this question. What are you tying your cord to? What are you hoping for? Let's pray. God, I thank you for the day you've given us. I thank you for your word. God, I pray even right now that you would speak to hearts, that you would give hope, that you would give peace, that you would just work as only you can work in our lives, that you would have your way.